We've been looking at, in the, the book of Romans, the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Rome, the church being most likely a, <clears throat> excuse me, a number of house churches because they didn't meet in big buildings or even little buildings like this. They met in homes in the first century. And so there would have been a group of leaders that were over the church and and then, uh, then the people themselves. And so as Paul is writing this letter to the church, it's to the church in general. Uh, very much the same way as if we look in the book of Acts, we see that when Paul met with the elders from Ephesus and Miletus, that there was a whole group of elders, probably different leaders from different house churches. So that's who this letter is addressed to. We've been looking at Paul's introduction. And Paul... Uh, introducing himself, uh, talking directly to these people about the grace of God, the gospel of God. We looked at that. And then we looked at, in verse 7, uh, we, went, we ended last time, a couple of weeks ago, by going halfway through the verse. He says, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. So what he's talking about here is those who are beloved of God, who are called, set apart, that's what that means, to be saints, to be holy ones. The Latin word for uh, holy is sanctus, and that those who have been been sanctified, who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. So he's writing this to the church, and and to those who are called, who are set apart. He says in the second half, where we're going to pick it up this morning, is grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the word father, the term father was new to these people in the first century. To the Jew, they had never referred to God as father. They would have been scandalized when Jesus prayed and he looked up towards heaven and said, Abba. And we'll talk about Abba, Father, when we get to Romans chapter 8 here, uh, because Paul goes into it and talks about the adoption that we have being brought into the family. And now we refer to God as our father, as our papa. But here he says, peace from God our father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace. Now, the the word for that is charis, is the Greek word for grace. Shalom is the Hebrew word for peace. So what he's doing, he's reaching across cultures. Remember, Paul is uniquely qualified in in the Roman Empire. He is a citizen of Rome, but he's also a Jew. He's also a Jewish citizen. He's a citizen of Israel. And and in God's foreknowledge, in the way that he set this up, that when he called this guy Saul of Tarsus, whose name became Paul, the apostle, Saul, his Hebrew name, Paul, his Greek name, he starts with a typical Greek greeting. He says charis. That's the Greek word, charis. is where we get the word charisma, which is the same word we use, by the way, for spiritual gifts. He says, which is a grace. They're graces. They're not things that we earn. They're not our abilities. They're gifts from God. They're graces. Uh, That's how, why that word is used. So he says Greek, charis, and Hebrew, shalom. He's talking to both groups. We know that there were Jews at the church in Rome. We're told that in this book, towards the end of the book. And we know that it is essentially a Gentile city. It's the capital of the world at that point. And he opens with charis and shalom. Very often what Paul did when he opened his letters is he opened with both. Again, cross-cultural. He wanted people to see there is no division. Remember when we were in the book of Exodus, or Ephesians, when we were in the book of Ephesians, we saw there in chapter 2, he says the wall of separation has been taken out of the way. And what he's talking about there is the wall that separated Jew and Gentile. And so there is no distinction in his mind and in God's mind. Uh, the other thing about this, I, I remember Pastor Chuck Smith, uh, he was the guy that founded the, the Calvary Chapel movement way back in the 1960s, and uh, he, whenever he taught through the letters, he would refer to these as the Siamese twins of the New Testament, grace and peace. Uh, and it's always in this order. It's never peace and grace. The reason in that gang, is you can't know the peace of God without first experiencing peace with God. You've got to come under the covenant. You've got to give your life to Christ in order to have peace with God. Out of that, you can have, you can experience the peace of God and 
that only comes by apprehending his grace. You have to lay hold of the grace of God first before you can have peace with God, before you can have the peace of God. So it's grace and peace. Uh, when Jesus hung on the cross and he said, to Telestai, uh, the word there, it translates literally, it is finished. That's the means by which we experience peace with God. It's never on the basis of human merit. It's not on the basis of achievement. It's not on the basis of intellect. We'll look at that. It is on the basis solely of his grace, his looking at you, looking at me and saying, I love you because I choose to love you, not because you are somehow worth my loving. And, and some of us are, but that's not the point. Some of us aren't. The point is it's all about him. It's about his grace. It's about having peace in my life as a result of having received his grace. A good acronym for grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what he did. It, it's, the, the price was paid. As far as peace goes, to be free from the, the state of agitation and conflict that we experience outside of Christ, in our own hearts, is what peace is. It, when Jesus said, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I to you, that's what he's talking about. That as we are set free, as we are set free from the things that bind us, from that, that constant state of agitation, that constant state of conflict inside, in our hearts, in our spirits, that's peace. Many people struggle with this. Many people struggle with grace. They struggle with God's approval. Many people struggle with God's approval of somebody else. <laughs> and, and yet, folks, talking with someone this last week about someone who I, I believe and I know is saved, and, and they're, they're, they're uncertain as to whether they go to heaven or not, because there's a lingering thing there of it depends on me. Well, I'm here to tell you, it does not depend upon you. It depends upon the finished work of Christ. To have any other view is to add that. It's to say somehow it wasn't enough. Very dangerous stance. Legalists love stance like that, stances like that, but it's just not, that's not true peace. Peace can only come by apprehending God's grace. There's some cart before the horse theology out there that puts it, bases it even. In, in a subtle way on works. Uh, but you know what God's word tells us in, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, John writes, Behold, take it up, look at it, study it. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. Not what he has given us because it's due but he freely bestows this love on us that we should be called children of God, that we should actually be included into the family, not just reconciled, not just added in, but kept at a distance. And when Paul says here, he talks about the father, he's talking about a relationship. He's talking about we now have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's what the Bible tells us. That's grace. That's the essence of having a relationship with God based solely in his grace. And he piles that love on. He, he, just, he is overwhelmed with love for us. Think about that, Lord. The, the, the Lord has such an abundance of love that, that he can't wait to have fellowship with us. I, I, the one preacher that loves to say, that, did you know that you're his favorite? And so are you. And so are you. And so are you. Because he wants, he pursues fellowship with us. That's the basis of the relationship. And that's driven by his grace. In John chapter 15, verse 13, Jesus' greater love has no man than this, than to lay down one's life for those who have cleaned up their act to come to him. It's not what it says. For those who deserve it, he lays down his life for those who deserve his laying down. No. 
This is for his friends. He loves you. He loves me. He calls us friends. First John 3, verse 2, he says, Beloved, now we are children of God, having had this love bestowed on us. And it's not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We are all in process. Every stinking one of us blows it. Every one of us has not arrived. That's not, that's not an excuse. It's not a license to sin. It's just stating it as it is. He, he is working in us. He is cleaning our hearts up as we go. He is putting his hand on one thing at a time as he works his will in our lives, his agenda for our lives. And as he is sanctifying us, and we'll get into that when we talk about the doctrine of sanctification, both the theological and the practical aspect of that, because both are revealed here in the book of Romans, we'll realize that that's a product of redemption. It's a product of me coming to him and saying, here I am. I I bring nothing. And until you get that right, you're stuck in religion. And, And God forbid that we get stuck, that we get mired in religion and religious philosophies which will be, it, the result is what Jesus talked to and when he got in the Pharisees, the religious leaders' faces there in that last week before he went to the cross and he said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You tithe mint and dill and cumin, but you neglect the weightier provisions of the law, such as mercy and justice. We don't want to be in that place. We want to be children of grace that God loves me because he simply chooses to love me. And I, by faith, appropriate that. I wear that. I pursue that. I apprehend that. And I put it on. What then becomes of my opinion of others when I realize it's solely by his grace that he has gotten a hold of me? I'm going to be gracious to others. I don't want to be like the guy in Matthew 18 where Jesus says, you know, this guy owed 50 million bucks and, 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 his master forgave the entire debt, said, you're totally free. You're totally free of it. And he went out and he laid hands on somebody that owed him 50 bucks and said, come on now, I'm going to haul you into prison, you know, all that stuff. And, and that's not, that, what he's illustrating there, folks, is that it is on the basis of his grace. We owe a debt that we can't pay. He paid a debt that he didn't owe. In 1 John 3, 3, he says, and everyone who has hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Now, that's what I mean when I say people get the cart before the horse. They think, well, let me clean myself up and then I'll get to God. No, as I come to him and as I, as I present myself to him and I say, Lord, here's my life. I trust, I believe. Your word says I am not my own. I was bought with a price and now come in and do whatever, have your way with me. I give you free reign in my life. As that takes place, you want to know what the result is? You want to walk in the light. On the believing side of his grace, the spirit-filled man or woman, saved by his grace, has an innate desire to live well, to live, to walk in the righteousness that we have been freely given in immeasurable supply. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, the apostle Paul says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. That's a great exhortation for us. Verse 8. Paul says first, (laughs) the first word in verse 8 is first, but what's interesting here is he says first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. He never gets to second. Have you noticed that? I mean, you read, you read down through this. He doesn't say, okay, now second. <laughs> he starts with first, and he doesn't go anywhere with it from there. And I believe that what's intended there is he's saying, let me start with what's most important, what's of foremost importance here. He says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now, when he says throughout the whole world, that's, he's using hyperbole. You guys know what hyperbole is? Hyperbole is overstating on purpose to make a point. I am so hungry I could eat a horse. I'm not going to eat a horse. Well, sometimes, no. 
But the point is, is that it's overstating to make a point. And when he says your faith is spoken about through the whole world, he's saying everybody, everybody talks about the faith of the church in Rome. And, and probably because they were on the front end of the persecution that was breaking out in the empire, it's the capital city. We don't know exactly why their faith was spoken of, but it was. And that's his point. He's, he's stating, look, everybody talks about, everybody knows who you guys are. It's synonymous. Your faith is synonymous with, with people that are living well in this empire. He begins, as I mentioned, with the word first. But I, again, I think that he wants to start. And you guys have got to understand something. Paul is about to, and we'll look at, we'll start next week and we'll be in it for a few weeks. When he launches into some very, very difficult things, he's going to start talking about, and we're going to hit the ground next week and start talking about the wrath of God and how it is revealed against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. And we will through that from chapter 1, verse 18, we're going to go through 17 this morning, through chapter 3, verse 20, we're going to see that nobody, nobody gets off. And yeah, we're going to talk about specific sins, specific areas of sin. But you've got to realize, and you've got to understand that in the greater context, is that if we want to start poking at those, we're poking at ourselves. Because that's his point in that. So when he's going to, he's going to get into that, he's going to talk about it, and, and he's... he's He's saying, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you saints at Rome. It, it, when he says that, it's an unusual statement. In verse 5, Paul states that it's through Christ that this gospel of God, remember we talked about that, he calls it the gospel of God. We know that this is a letter, this is a book, it's written about God. He's, in verse 5, he says that that's through Christ that this gospel of God comes to us. What we see in this is the mediatory and priestly roles of Christ uh, come into play. In other words, he's, why would he say, it, 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 again, it sounds weird, but he says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ. Well, isn't Jesus God the Son? Yes, he is. But it's through the work of Christ. It's the only way that you can approach God. And he knows that. That's why he says it this way. It sounds kind of odd. It even looks odd in the original language, but it's not. If you understand the context and the content of what he's saying, is he's saying that's because Jesus is the mediator. I think about Job chapter 9, where Job says, why is there no umpire, no daysman? Why is there no one to stand between you and me that I wouldn't fear your wrath? Speaking prophetically, way back then, even in Job's day, in the days of the patriarchs, speaking prophetically of the need for a mediator. We see in Moses that Moses was a mediator of that covenant. He was the one that God went through, representing God to the people and the people to God. We see that in the book of Hebrews, when we studied in the book of Hebrews, we see that Jesus is our great high priest. He represents you and I to the Father, and he represents the Father to you and I. In that sense, he fulfills the priestly role even though there are no priests in the classical sense of the word in the New Covenant. Churches that have those are aberrant. It's, it's bad theology. The point is, that's why, why Paul says, look, I thank my God through Jesus Christ. It's through his work, through his work as a mediator, through his work as a high priest. Getting us to God. Getting God to us. That's how it's accomplished. Obviously by the work of his Holy Spirit. So he also, in this, he begins with a word of affirmation for these people. This is important. You know, he doesn't open up <laughs> with the statements he begins in with verse 18. Let me talk to you about the wrath of God on all the unrighteousness and unholiness and ungodliness and all of that. No, because he knows that he doesn't have... Yeah, he knows some of the people. As we mentioned, there's 26 people in chapter 16 that he knows by name. But this is a large church, a group of churches. 
And there are a lot of people that he wouldn't know. And the first thing he does, he, he establishes his apostolic authority. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Now he wants to appeal that to them on the basis of a relationship. He doesn't want to hit the ground with this very difficult, hard doctrinal stuff first. He wants them to know his heart towards them. Very, very important because the written word can be tricky. Uh, I sometimes call it third-rate communication, uh, and, and talking about texting and, and all of that. It, it, texting is fine for, hey, what's for dinner? Or can you call me or whatever? But for weighty stuff, you've got to be really careful to be able to put, because there's no, there's no tone, there's no inflection, there's no body language. And so what Paul is doing here is he's revealing his heart for them first. This is the written word. And he knows that he has to appeal to them rather than have them perceive that he's on the attack, that he's just going to come and start dismantling these people and letting them know where they're at. So it's very important what he does here. He's, he's letting them he's, see his heart. That's why he starts with this powerful word of affirmation. He, he's... he's it's important because of the nature of what he's about to launch into. They needed to see the depth of love and sincerity that he had for them, and he indeed did. This wasn't just, well, let me soften him up and you know, schmooze for a while. He's letting them know how he truly feels about these people. And when he says, I long to come free to you, he means it. He didn't want them to interpret this as an attack. He wanted them to see that where he was going with this, because he is an apostle. He is different. Now, he trusted that the church in Rome had good leaders. We know that because he doesn't write to correct in this letter. And he, we know that he's not afraid to correct in his other letters. So there's solid leadership there, but it wasn't apostolic leadership. Apostolic leadership meant you were taught by Christ himself. That was the qualifying mark of an apostle. That's why in Galatians, Paul says, I'm an apostle. I was taught by direct revelation of Christ, from Christ, after the fact. But that doesn't mean, he says, basically, that's the qualifying mark. Because they were saying, well, Paul's not really an apostle. He wasn't there until after the resurrection. He was still attacking and, and persecuting the church. No, when he went off to Arabia, he was taught by Christ himself. And that qualified him. So he is an apostle. He has apostolic authority. He has apostolic understanding. And he wants to bring that to these people. He wants to do it in such a way that he's not perceived as being on the attack against the leaders of the church in Rome or the people in the church in Rome. And so this is wonderful stuff that he has to say here. He says in verse 9, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit. The word there is pneuma. It's where we get the word air. I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. With that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. What does he mean when he says, I serve with my pneuma, with my spirit? There's the seen world and the unseen world. We know as Christians that we are part of an unseen kingdom. That's what Jesus said when he was before Pilate. He says, my kingdom is not of this realm. And when he said, and that word realm means if you're standing there and you're pointing at the ground on both sides of you, my kingdom is not of this physical realm. And so when Paul says, look, I serve him with my spirit. I serve him with the unseen man. And we can derive from that. We serve him with the unseen man, the unseen woman. And and essentially what he's saying is my life is consumed with this gospel of his son. It's not some outward drudge. It's not something that I'm doing by rote. It's it's, it's a dynamic inward leading. That's the pneuma that he's talking about here. That's the pneuma that you and I have as we have the Spirit, as we have the Holy Spirit of God living on the inside, revealing the kingdom of God to us from the inside, the unseen kingdom. It's about who I am in Christ. It's about the fact that my life is hidden in the beloved. It's about the fact that we live and we operate out of this unseen kingdom in a physical world. And baby, let me tell you, it's going south in a hurry. Doesn't take much to see. 
But we don't take our cues from this world. We don't take our cues from the government. Yeah, we want to live in obedience to the government, the government, the governing authorities, as long as it's not in direct contradiction with what we have in Christ and, and with the commands that we have from him. But yes, we live according to the unseen realm. I was reading about a court case, uh, the guy, pastor's Calvary Chapel in Bangor, Maine, Ken Graves. Uh, he spoke at our men's conference a couple of years ago. It's just a, a powerful, dynamic speaker, and, and he is up against, today, they were opening uh, against the Democratic governor's orders to have parking lot services and some other stuff going on. And he was saying, look, I have a mandate from Christ. And, and, and they are looking, I don't know, he might be in jail by now, but they were literally threatening jail time to him. I read about a, a, a pastor in Canada that just this last week went to jail because he had the audacity to open his church. He was doing it safely. He was doing it following all of the prescribed deals that they have for Home Depot or whatever else. But folks, we take our cues. We, we live with an unseen king and in an unseen kingdom. And, and yes, people have different views, different opinions, and I have plenty of room for that. And yet, what we want to do is be obedient to our king and to the mandates that he has for us. When he says, in verse 10, he says, making request if by some means now at last I may find a way by the will of God to come to you. He's praying. He says, look, I, I mention you all the time in my prayers. Romans, you guys are on my heart. You're in my prayers constantly. Uh, and, and he constantly and continually prayed for this church, for these people. That's part of who he is, is a man of prayer. Uh, he gives two kinds of prayer here. Now, when I was going through my notes, and as I was studying for this, I came across some notes from a study that I gave on prayer, uh, and it talks about there are six different kinds of prayer that are revealed in God's word. And it's a great, and perhaps I'll, I'll do that study some other time, but he specifically talks about two kinds of prayer here. The first is a prayer of intercession. And that's where you pray on the behalf of another. You intercede for them. Father, and we've been praying for Leah. Let's, let's pray for Leah right now. Lord, we pray for Leah Gustafson right now as she's dealing with this autoimmune disorder and, and just in, had some dangerous things going on. We, we lift her to you, Father. We, we intercede on her behalf. We pray for healing. We pray for comfort. We pray for rest and peace for Matt and Mandy and just give them to you in Jesus' name. That's interceding. And we want to continue to do that. Leah has had, she had, she's been in Dornbecker Children's Hospital twice in the last week uh, with some blood disorders and all that. So uh, just so you know, please pray for her. Paul's interceding. He's saying, look, I pray for you guys all the time. That's intercession. He's also saying, though, he, he's offering a prayer of faith. He's giving a petition. He's petitioning God that he can go to Rome. So two kinds, intercession and petition. And both of those folks, intercession is, is very important to pray on behalf of another. I know people in this body, and they'll be unnamed, I'm aware of them, that are prayer warriors. They're, they're people that are just constantly in prayer. I know that if I put something on the prayer chain, they're there. They're praying. They're lifting these things up. And that's a blessing because if, it, if he doesn't do it, it's not getting done. How do we do that? How do we move things in the spiritual realm? We petition the Lord we intercede for others, we pray, and that's how it happens. I often think about, and, and I don't say this to head trip anybody at all, but our, our Sunday night online prayer gathering uh, at 7 o'clock, um, I, I pray for that gathering. I pray that that gathering would grow because it's one of the lowest attended things in our church. Because the enemy knows that when it comes to prayer, he's gonna, I'm going to be busy. I'm going to have things to do. And there are times where I have things to do. Like I said, it's not a head trip. But I pray that God would put it upon people's hearts because they would understand the importance, the critical nature of that ministry. It is critical as we come together, as we pray, as we bear one another's burdens, as we lift those things to the Lord, as we pray for our church, we pray for our community, we pray for one another. We intercede 
we petition. I came across a, a quote on prayer, and I'm going to read it to you. I thought that this was good because it's, it, it encompasses, there are so many aspects of prayer, and like I said, I, can't, I don't have time to get into the six kinds of prayer, but when Paul is saying, hey, Romans, I'm praying for you, and I'm praying that I can come to you, bold. Uh, this is a quote from uh, one of the church fathers in, I think, the fourth century. He says, the effect of prayer is union with God. And if someone is with God, he is separated from the enemy. I think that's good. <clears throat> Through prayer, we remain chaste, we control our temper, and rid ourselves of vanity. It makes us forget injuries, overcome envy, defeats injustice, and makes amends for sin. Through prayer, we obtain physical well-being and a happy home. In prayer, we pray for a strong and well-ordered society. Keep praying for that. Prayer is the pledge of faithfulness in marriage. It shields the wayfarer, protects the sleeper, and gives courage to those who keep vigil. It will refresh you when you are weary and comfort you when you are sorrowful. Prayer is the delight of the joyful as well as the solace of the afflicted. Prayer is intimacy with God and contemplation of the invisible. I like that. Prayer is the enjoyment of things present and the substance of things to come. Isn't that good? A healthy prayer life is essential to maintaining spiritual equilibrium in your own life. Pray, church, whether it's with the group or praying, just, I just exhort you, pray. Understand the critical nature of staying connected to our Father. In his petitioning God that he could come to Rome, there's no way that Paul could have known that he would end up with a one-way ticket. He always wanted to visit. He wanted to go on one of his journeys, you know, and, and, and he's thinking in his mind as he's saying this, man, I can't wait to get to you. I just, I want to come to you. And yet in God's providence, again, no, there's no way that Paul, when he wrote this, that he could know that he would go to Rome after he was arrested in Jerusalem, after they parked him at Caesarea Maritima for a couple of years, and then they took him by boat, <laughs> perilous journey, to Rome in chains. When he finally got to Rome, he would be in chains. He couldn't know that. What are you praying about? What are you praying for? <laughs> are you open to God's ways? Because his ways are not our ways. His way of doing things, you know, he's, God answers his prayer. But it didn't look like he pictured it would look, did it? <laughs> Not by a long shot. Um, in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, Isaiah writes, from, he's talking, speaking for God here, he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. He goes on to say, they're beyond your finding out. What he's saying in this, uh, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I know through my life, uh, there are times where I, I have this little mental photo album <laughs> and I haul it out and I think, well, when I get to this point, this is what it's going to look like. And when I get over, you know, we're going to have a little white house and the picket fence in the front and the flowers and, you know, all of the stuff, you know, we, we, we idealize things and that's human nature. It's just what we do. Are you open for your little mental photo album to be wrong? Are you open for God to, in reality, work things in a way that you don't see right off? You gotta understand, he does not exist to do my bidding. I, you know, I, I marvel at his ways being beyond my ways, his thoughts being beyond my thoughts. In verse 11, he says, for I long to see you. I long. I, I, every time I read that, I think he says, I long to see you. It's like I got this in my heart. I just long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts so that you may be established. When he talks about imparting some spiritual gift, it's the same wording that Jesus uses in Luke chapter 3, where he says, when, if a man has two tunics, shirts, kind of what those were, let him give to him who has none. The word impart, I long to impart some spiritual gift is the same as what he says there. Let him impart what he has to the other. And what it means is to share with, what, with others what one has come to possess. 
So Paul has come to possess this knowledge of the gospel, the gospel of God, the gospel of his son, the gospel of Christ. We see all of those at work in this. He refers to it in different ways. It's all the same message, the same gospel. He longs to come to them so that he can impart these things to them. His fervent longing uh, was to share with the Christians in Rome so that they would be further established in their faith. You know, and that's my heart here, folks. That's that my heart for this church is that we would just continue to grow, that we would grow in the grace and the knowledge of him, that as God, by his Holy Spirit, drives his messages home in my heart, that I would apply those things to my life and I would grow. That's his revealed design. That's what Paul's heart here is for Rome. He's not wanting to come in there and supplant the leaders that are established there. He's not, he doesn't have it on his heart. Well, you just get out of the way. I'm the great apostle Paul. You guys are just you know, holding place till I get... No, that's not him at all. There's real humility, and we'll see that here in a minute. So how does he go about this? And, and, and church, I think we, in many ways, and I mean the the larger church, not our church, because I'm <laughs> kind of strong on some of these things. In many ways, we've gotten it wrong. Uh, we're not going to share what we possess through imparting cultural relevance. Let's dress the church up like the world and effectively water down the gospel. When I read that book years ago, The Purpose Driven Church, I thought, what an absolute tragedy that we're going to reduce the things of God to uh, being seeker friendly. Yeah, we're not going to be rude. We're going to love on you if you come. But the message of the gospel is offensive. It's foolishness to the natural man. We're, it's called the offense of the gospel. We're told that the gospel is salt. And what does salt do to people who have not experienced the, the saving hand of Christ? It, it hurts. It stings. It's not through cultural relevance. It's not through imparting an entertaining music service. I love good worship music. Don't get me wrong. In, in our worship team, I was so blessed with the set this morning with Julia and um, Jennifer singing, just the way they harmonize together. Yeah, we, we want to worship God well, but we are not out to entertain. I, I see that happening. It's not about entertainment. I'll never forget telling the guy that was griping about our worship in the church I was at in California, and I could let him kind of get all done with all his stuff, and I said, well, you know, Jim, we're not doing it for you. And he was like, what? <laughs> I said, we're doing it for him. We're inviting you to come along. That's the spirit of worship. Those are the people that we're told in the Gospel of John, Jesus says the Father seeks such to worship him in spirit and in truth. So it's not about entertaining. It's not about cultural relevance. It's not about having a strategic church growth plan. I told somebody the other day, you know, I really don't care, and I, I, I love what God is doing in the hearts of the people in this body, and if we end up being a small church for the rest of my days, I am fine with that. More than fine. I just want to, us to be the church that God wants. It, do I care about the size of our church? No, I don't. Do I care about the condition of the people's hearts in it? Oh, yeah, I, very much so. I, I care about you folks getting the nurture, about you folks getting the message of the gospel being that God loves you. He he, he loves you to distraction. I care about the message. I don't care about entertainment. I don't care about cultural relevance. I don't care about church growth programs. You should see the mail we get sometimes. My goodness. People have all kinds of gimmicks to draw people in. I'll tell you what, that what you do to, to draw people is that what you have to do to keep them. And if we're keeping people by the word of God, praise him. We're going to end up with healthy healthy sheep, healthy Christians. Now, when he talks about the gift here, he says, I long to impart some spiritual gift to you. Uh, he, what he's talking about there is it primarily has to do with the internal ministry of the church in Rome. He's not talking about evangelism here. Now, we'll get to that before you think, oh my gosh. <laughs> no, he gets to that in verse 13. 
But here what he's talking about is having the church being equipped for every good work like he did with the Ephesians when he talked about that. All right? He, he's talking about the spiritual fiber of their church. And that's the important thing. The, the, when he's talking about imparting some spiritual gift, he wants to strengthen the spiritual fiber of their church, the, the, the core of their church. Because if you strengthen the core, the branches are healthy. And, and he understands that. It's a matter of augmenting their spiritual growth through the ministry of the word of God. Not through gimmicks. Not through stuff. We're going to stand for the word of God here. And that's what we stand on. In Paul's case, it would be the logos. He would reason from the scriptures whenever he got into a new town. And it would also be the rhema, the spoken word. Because we know that in Paul's writing this letter, that in Paul's communicating the gospel, that the New Testament was coming about. And that was through the spoken word of that day being recorded and now the written word that we have in front of us. Verse 12, he says, That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. I love that. He goes on to explain that his intentions here with the church at Rome, that they don't just run one direction, like, I'm here to bless you. You That's that's not where he's coming from. Uh, He says, look, there's going to be a mutual blessing when I come to you. You know, I, I get, I get the, the privilege, the opportunity of ministering to you, and you are going to minister to me because I know that that's what happens. That's the dynamic that happens when the Holy Spirit is in it. Uh, in, in, in Proverbs 27, 17, he says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. I love how much I learn from you. It doesn't matter if I'm the pastor What it means is that we sharpen one another. What it means is that through the fellowship that we share, God is speaking to me in ways you very often uh, don't even realize. And the same thing the other way around. It's it's, it's a mutual thing. And I think about Paul's humility here. Here he is, the great Apostle Paul, capital P. (laughs) And he's saying, you know what? We get to be a blessing to one another when I get there. Isn't that exciting? And I think it's great. I think it's exciting, and I think it's the, great, it's the right attitude to have for somebody that is serving the Lord, especially somebody in a position of leadership, because there is no such thing as some kind of a, a spiritual stuck-up hierarchy where I'm the pastor, you're the sheep now, you better just toe the line. No, I've told you guys many times, if I wasn't the pastor, I'd like to go, go into church here too, because I, I really like the people in this church, and I think it's a, it's a church where the, the love of Christ is evident. The point is, it's a level playing field. There is positional authority. Yes, God raises up positional authority. And and somebody has to make the hard calls and all of that. I I get all that. It has nothing to do with the fact that we're brothers and sisters in Christ and that we are a blessing to one another when we share true fellowship in Christ. I think his point in this is he's saying, look, I'm not above benefiting by other saints. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, a very dear passage to my heart. When I was ordained back in 1994 into the pastorate, uh, I I prayed. (laughs) Actually, I was freaked out because I didn't know I was getting ordained. Um, I said, Lord, what does this mean? What does this mean? And he directed me to 1 Peter 5, where where Peter says, I who am an elder, I'm speaking to you fellow elders, shepherd the flock of God which is among you. He says, not for sordid gain. Don't, don't do it for bad motives. One of the things he says there is not to lord it over other people's faith. That's not your deal. That's, you are not, and as a leader, and when I talk to other leaders, when I see them having a haughty attitude or an arrogant attitude of, you know, I'm going to set these people straight, big red flags, big red flags. You know, come in, I'm going to change all this. I'm going to get this church running right. Big red flags. Enough said. His mission here was it wasn't, he wanted to be, he's being, again, he's being careful in what he writes to these people. He wants that, them to understand that he's not there to challenge them, 
but he's there to share in the mutual faith that they have with him. Verse 13, now I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but I was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. So this is where he starts talking about, this is evangelism that he's talking about here when he talks about having fruit among the Gentiles. This is among the other Gentiles. So his plans to go to Rome were hindered, and, and yet that hindrance was not a hindrance to God's plan for him. I want you to understand there's a difference there. He says, I was hindered in coming to you, but that wasn't a hindrance to God. We can interpret that the wrong way, guys. We can interpret that as, well, if I'm hindered, then God must need, you know, God's hindered, his plan is hindered. No, that's not how it works. You've got to remember, he's transcendent. What that means, he's, he's over all of it. And being over all of it, if there's a hindrance that comes, very often it's to teach me something. It's not that he is being hindered. He doesn't, he's not hindered by much, like anything at all, ever. But there were three things, three ways, as we look at the New Testament, three ways in which Paul, the apostle, was hindered. And, and as uh, I'll go through them briefly, I just think it's fascinating when we look at this. The first, we looked in, in chapter 15, where he was hindered by pressing ministry needs. All right? He says, I didn't want to build on another man's work. In other words, as I mentioned, this church was already established, and he's writing to a church he'd never been to. And he said, look, I have been busy bringing the gospel to churches that are not established, to establishing churches throughout the empire. That's why he made his missionary journeys. He would kept going to town after town after town, preaching the gospel, raising up leaders, elders, and then moving on. And these churches would begin to grow and thrive. That's the work that he primarily was about. What that did, and what he tells us in the book of Romans, like I said, late in the book, is that hindered him from coming to Rome earlier. He didn't, and it didn't bother him much because he was confident of the leadership that was already in place there. He says, I was hindered by pressing needs, by fulfilling the ministry God gave me. Another thing that we see in 1 Thessalonians 2, that he was opposed by Satan himself. He says in, in, in that place, he says, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. Finally, we see that he was directly restrained by the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 16, it, it, we're told in, in Acts 16, 6, it says, now when they, and they is Paul and Timothy and Silas, the three of them were together, uh, traveling together. They, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, that's sort of the southeastern part of the empire, uh, just to the northeast of, or northwest of, of Israel. When we had gone through that region, it says they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now you might read this and go, why on earth would the Holy Spirit forbid the preaching of the gospel? Because if you read that standalone, you go, yeah, it'll leave you scratching your head. Why, why did he do that? But if you go on in Acts chapter 16, the answer is very clear. They were hindered from going to Asia because the Holy Spirit was directing them another way. He put a block on them. They want, it says they wanted to go up to a place called Bithynia, which is in the northern part, up in Asia. And, and that the Holy Spirit said no, and then Paul went to sleep. He had a dream, and there was a guy from Macedonia, which was due west, into the northwest. Uh, from where they were, he has a dream, and this Macedonian guy says, please come and help us. So they go west instead of north. The Holy Spirit blocked their northern passage so that he could fulfill his plans to pull them into Macedonia, which is northern Greece. And there he would continue his journey uh, that's where he and Silas would be thrown into jail, and then they would go from there to Thessalonica, from there to Berea, from there to Athens, and then to Corinth. You know, they did this whole deal, but it was because the Holy Spirit blocked them from going north. So he was directly restrained, hindered by the Holy Spirit. The important point is that in all of these hindrances, God allowed it. God engineered it. Have you been hindered? in some way. 
Also, I, as I studied this, I, I, I was reminded of when we got this building. <laughs> I wasn't happy about it. I, I really wasn't. I, and I'm just being transparent with you. To me, it was a hindrance. We were fine. You know, we had this big, you know, this building over here where we seated 250 people and we room to spread out and grow and, blah, 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 and all of that. And, and, and I was like, Lord, I don't get this, you know. And, and yet now I look at it, I think this is one of the greatest blessings that our church corporately has ever had. I love this place. And I see God's hand all over it. One of the things that was true is in the place that we were before, is we were told that the only way that we would lose that is if the church that owned it had to leave the high school. And guess what happened with COVID? They had to leave the high school. We would have been trying to go around and rent the space. And with a lot of older people in our congregation, it's like, and myself included, do you think I want to be setting up and tearing down every time? I mean, what a blessing. That's just one thing about it. My point is, I want to be teachable, just like you. And the Lord was teaching me that everything that looks like a hindrance isn't. And to be patient. Hebrews 10, 36 is something that God has taken me to over and over and over again over the years. He says, for you have need of patience or endurance that after having done the will of God, to wait for what's been promised. God is so faithful. He is so faithful with this little church. He is so faithful with us that even when we don't see it and we look at something as a hindrance, he's going, you're, you're, you're not seeing it. Just wait. Just let me, let me work. And he's worked some real powerful, tremendous blessings in spite of your pastor, I might say. But he loves us and he's out to bless us. We, always, we don't always see it, but that doesn't change the fact that he's good and he's got our best in mind. All of these things that hindered Paul weren't hindrances at all to the plan of God being worked out in his life and for the kingdom. I remember in Proverbs 16.9, it, it says, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. We establish our plans. That's great. That's fine. But God directs our steps. We've got to be open to that. We've got to be open to and be flexible to the moving of the Holy Spirit in our own lives and in our life as a fellowship. Uh, back to verse 13, he says, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. When he speaks of fruit here, it's a reference to the fruit of the gospel among the Gentiles in Rome. He's talking about evangelism. Paul's constant yearning was for fruit for God in the souls of others, in winning the souls of others. That was his evangelistic heart. It's also a characteristic of true ministers of Christ. We are all called to be ministers. I, yeah, I, I'm vocationally a minister, but it doesn't mean that you are any less a minister than I am, because what that is is a servant. And we'll see here how important it is that we take this gospel and get it out there. He says in verse 14, I'm a debtor. Uh, it's rendered in other translations, I'm under, under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and unwise. What does he mean by that? He's not saying Greeks and savages. Now, when we think about a barbarian, I think about somebody that's barbaric. You know, it's somebody that comes in with a hatchet or whatever. He's, that's, not the, that's not what a barbarian is in this culture. All right? The Greek word is barbaros. Okay? Where it's believed the etymology, which is the study of words, the etymology behind that is it's believed that that word evolved from when you were dealing with somebody that spoke it. Have you ever stood there with somebody talking in another language and you have not a clue what they're saying? In this culture, they looked at that as they were going bar, 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 bar. That's how the word barbarian came about. It was somebody that spoke a different language and it was unintelligible. He's saying to Greeks and to non-Greeks is what he's saying here. That's what barbarians means. In the same way that when we look at uh, the history of Israel, we see that there are Jews and Gentiles. A Gentile is anybody that's not a Jew, right? So when he's talking about Greeks and barbarians, a barbarian is anybody that's not a Greek. 
So it's just how they culturally looked at things. It's not a slam on a certain class of people. It's just saying that they're people that are not part of Greek culture, not part of Greek society. So he says, I'm a debtor to both Greeks and non-Greeks, to the wise and the unwise. Um, When he talks about the wise and the unwise, it's more personal than just wise and unwise uh, or educated and uneducated. What he's talking about is in this is to, to all manner and degrees of intelligence. In other words, there is no such thing as somebody that's not smart enough to be a Christian. It's not, a, it's not based on intellect, not at all. Many err and think that it does, that it is based on intellect. What he's saying here is to the wise and the unwise, this gospel, I am a debtor to Greeks and non-Greeks, and to people who are are wise, who have a high intellect, and I'm a debtor, equally a debtor, to people that have a lower intellect. Because he knows that it's not about intellect. Here's the deal. Anybody who has Christ is someone who possesses the answers to the world's deepest needs. Say it again. Anybody You, me, if we belong to Christ, we have the answer to the world's deepest needs. You guys hear me say all the time, we have answers. We live in a world that is worsening by the day. Every day you get up, you look at the headlines, you go, oh my goodness, what are they cooking up now? And people are getting more and more stressed out because there's no answers in our culture. There's no answers in politics. Oh my goodness, not going to go there. I'm tempted for a rabbit trail, but that would totally be a distraction. My point is, is we have answers because the answers are, are coming from the unseen realm that he's talking about here. The answers are from the kingdom of God, not the kingdoms of this world. The answers that we possess don't, don't have to do with how smart or how not smart we are. They have to do with him. They have to do with his glory. They have to do with the fact that he died to redeem humanity. And for anybody who would come by faith, those are the people that he wants to reach. Paul is saying here, he's saying, I'm a debtor. I am in their debt. I I have to do this. I owe them the message. That's what he's saying. When he says, I'm a debtor to Jews or to Greeks and, and, and to barbarians, to those who are wise, those who are unwise, he's saying, I it doesn't matter. I owe them this message. I owe them the gospel because that's where the answers are found. That's where the cure to disease, the disease of sin is found. It's where the way of escape from the jaws of hell is found. It's where there's a guarantee of everlasting life and fulfillment that you're not going to find on this earth. It's where it's found. I am a debtor to those things. I owe these people. And folks, we owe the world around us the, the answers that the gospel brings and provides. And if that doesn't light a fire in your heart, you might have some wet wood you need to tend to. Because the world is perishing around us. The time is short. I am absolutely convinced the time is short. And we of all people should be willing to stand up and take a risk on Aunt Millie getting mad at me or whatever it is to say, you know what? Let me tell you about a better way. Let me tell you about the unseen world that I happen to be connected to because I am filled with an unseen spirit called the Holy Spirit of God. Let me tell you where you can find answers to all of the mess that you see out there. Let me tell you where you can find peace in the middle of all the garbage that's being peddled. Let me tell you about Jesus. If you're watching online and you don't know Jesus this morning, as I said, time is short. Give your life to Christ. Give your heart to him. What that looks like is that you ask him to forgive you for your sins. You trust that Jesus went to the cross for you to cleanse you, to give you a new life. Folks, the stakes are high. Hell is real. And we need to understand that those around us, I, it does, as nice as they might be, I use that term, air quotes, nice, as good as they may be. We're going to see as we study the book of Romans that 
they got to have the righteousness of God to get into heaven. And if they don't, none of that matters. Give your life to Christ. If you have been struggling in your relationship with the Lord, He loves people recommitting their hearts to Him. He loves it when we come to Him in humility and say, you know, Lord, uh, even it might be through this pandemic or through other circumstances, whatever, I, I, I've, just, I've allowed myself to drift. And I know that you have the answers. And I want to be somebody who is securely within your will. All you have to do is ask him to forgive you and he'll cleanse you. Instant restoration. Doesn't matter how many steps away from God you take, it's always only one step back. Praise God. We have a solemn obligation from God, as did Paul here, to share the good news, the gospel, with people of all cultures, barbarians, <laughs> people of all degrees of learning and intelligence, wise and unwise. We're indebted. As, as Paul says here, I, I am in debt to them. I have to do it. I owe them, is what he's saying. And he held it so, he held this conviction so deeply that he actually put himself in that place. Here's this highly, highly educated guy. Here's this guy, man, he was steeped in theology. Here's this guy, he was steeped in his culture, in Judaism. He was, he was the guy. And he said, to the lowest one in any culture, I owe them the gospel. What a change from the man who used to go around arresting people and persecuting them. He's not satisfied by simply holding that conviction. He'll only find satisfaction when he can act on it. Verse 15, he says, So, as much as is in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. He, so, as I mentioned, he didn't plant the church in Rome, and he's been reluctant to be too aggressive here. <laughs> when we get to the next passage, there will be plenty of room for that. It's not being aggressive. He's just being very honest about the condition of man, the condition of man's heart outside of Christ. In verses um, uh, 16 and following, or 17 and following. But what he's doing here is he, he's saying, look, this isn't a burden to bear. It's not a duty that I must carry out. When, and when he says here, uh, I'm ready. The, the word translates in all the major translations, except New King James, for whatever reason, it translates eager. He's not saying, I'm ready like I'm just equipped. He's saying, I can't wait. I'm raring to go. Uh, he, this is something that's not a burden for me. This is something that it comes naturally because I love Jesus and I love you and I want to see you I want to see, be able to see you grow. I want to see you equipped. I want to see people come into his kingdom. When he says to preach the gospel, it's one word in the original. Let's step it up a little bit. We're running a little behind. Uh, one word in the original, and, and I, I shared this with the men a couple weeks ago uh, on Tuesday night. Uh, and the Greek word for to preach the gospel is euangelizo. Uh, it's where we get the word evangelize. And what it means is to tell, to speak the good news, to communicate the gospel, or to announce or to proclaim the gospel. All of those are, it's all part of defining this one word. And since Rome is an established church, the proclamation of the gospel would include a teaching ministry in the churches and an evangelistic preaching ministry to the unsaved. Both would be in place and discipleship for both. That's the first century model that we have for a healthy church today. I just shared the gospel. It, 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 it's evangelistic. It's speaking forth the word. And I've been teaching you folks. I've been proclaiming the gospel as we go along this morning. That's part of what we do. And we do that with one another when we enjoy and share fellowship together. So in verse 16, he gets to the theme of Romans. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Remember, when he opens this, he says, charis and shalom. He says, grace and peace. He's speaking to Greeks and Jews. 
And he's saying the same thing here. This is this gospel. I'm not ashamed of it. It's the power of God. It's, it's the power of God for salvation for everybody. First for the Jews. We see in that that uh, when he says, look, to the Jew first, remember when Jesus, when he's coming over the brow of the hill on the Mount of Olives, riding down into Jerusalem on that Sunday before he would be crucified the following Friday, he prophesied over the city and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you've killed the prophets, the ones I've sent to you. And he wept over the city. He said, I would love to have gathered you as a, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. They rejected Messiah. Yeah, the palm fronds and all the hoopla, that was a show. By the next Friday, it would be the same people screaming, crucify him. They rejected Messiah. As a result, the gospel went to the Gentiles. That's why he says to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He's unashamed of this gospel. Uh, The astonishing message of a crucified guy from Nazareth, uh, which was kind of a nobody town in those days. Everybody that was somebody was in the southern part of the nation, in Jerusalem and and all that. It's a guy that was despised by the Jews, put to death by the Romans. He knows the inherent glory of the message of the gospel is God's life-giving message to a dying world. That's his point. And this truth permeated Paul's soul. He said, God forbid that I not preach the gospel. God forbid that I not be able to give this message. So we've seen in verse 1, the gospel of God. In verse 9, the gospel of his son. And in verse 16, the gospel of Christ. He uses all three. We, and, and we know that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. They're co-equal. They share the same attributes. Three distinct persons, but one essence, essentially one God. But when he talks about, he uses the same word here, the word gospel. That's, now, the verb is to speak it. The noun is to hold it, is to understand it. It's like it, it, what I shared with the guys. It's like, say you have a great big bowl, and you have all the central doctrines of Christianity all of the work of redemption that God did on our behalves, and you put it all into this bowl. That's the word euangelion, or where the word that, me, that translates gospel. Good news. It's the good news from God. All right? Now, when we speak it, it's taking what's in that bowl and giving it out to people, proclaiming it to people. You put the wrong stuff in that bowl, you got a real problem. That's why Paul in Galatians says, if anybody or an angel from heaven, if they give you another gospel, another bowl full of stuff that doesn't match up with this, let them be cursed of God. Very, very strong language there. So when he's talking about that, he's talking about the content of the gospel with, with this word euangelion. Uh, Galizo is speaking it Evangelion, the, the word gospel, is the substance of the gospel. We're to understand that also, as we look at this, the three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they're working in this. And I want to explain. The Father willed the gospel. It's the Father's will. Okay? John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his Son. God God willed this from from before the foundations of the earth that this would be the way that he would redeem mankind to himself. The Son accomplishes the gospel. In John 17, 4, Jesus in his great priestly prayer to the Father the night before he would be on the cross that following morning, he says, I glorified you on the earth by accomplishing the work which you have given me to do. So the Father willed it, the Son accomplishes it, and the Spirit applies it. In John 16, 8, Jesus speaking prophetically, he says, it's to your advantage that I go away because if I don't go, the Helper can't come, the Holy Spirit can't come. But if I do go, this is what's going to happen. The Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. 
That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He applies the redemptive work of God to individual hearts. If you're watching this or listening to this and you don't know Christ and you've got that strong compulsion that you need to get your life right with him, that's the work of the Holy Spirit applying this message. I've got nothing to say in and of myself. I really don't. I like telling people, I'm the delivery boy. I didn't write the paper. I'm just throwing it in your yard. But the Spirit of God is the one who applies the message. I know when somebody says, Pastor, that was a great message, that that I can trust that they're hearing from the Lord. It's not me. That's a settled issue a long time ago. It's him. It's him honoring his word. It's him honoring the message. So why would Paul not be ashamed? He knows, folks, and we need to know the power of God to transform lives is held within that message. He'll transform any life, anywhere, in any culture, any race, in any social or economic status, across the political spectrum, at any level of intellect. He came to seek and save that which was lost. That's why he's not afraid of it. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. He tells us in Romans 11 why it went to the Jews first and why it went to the Gentiles. And we're told there that the gospel went to the Gentiles to provoke the Jews to jealousy. One of the purposes that God was fulfilling in that. But we know all through God's word that God had his eye on the Gentiles. He, he, Israel was called to be a light, what? Unto the Gentiles, unto the nations. They were to represent God to the nations. They didn't do it very well because their hearts had never been changed. That's the beauty of the new covenant. That's the beauty of the work of, the, of Christ is that now with the Holy Spirit revealing God to me from the inside, I can be a light. he allowed the gospel to go to the Gentiles because all along he wanted to save the Gentile nations. He's also using it, and we'll get into it in chapter 11, which will probably be about nine years from now. No, I'm kidding. Um, But when we get into chapter 11, he he says, I did that to provoke the Jews to jealousy, right? Until then, because they rejected me, we're told in 2 Corinthians that a veil lies over their heart and they will not see it until they come to Christ. The veil is removed in Christ, we're told. Verse 17, we'll wrap this up. He says, for in it, in what? The gospel. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, that's the first mention of the word righteousness here in the book of Romans. We're going to talk about it a lot in the weeks and months to come. But the point I want to make with you this morning is he's talking about the righteousness of God being revealed from faith to faith. The question is, do I want to stand in my righteousness or in the righteousness of God? Here's what my righteousness looks like. Isaiah 64, 6. We are all like an unclean thing, Isaiah writes, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. That's what standing in my righteousness looks like to God. Filthy rags. As we look ahead at what it is to be justified by faith, we'll discover that it has to be on the basis of the the righteousness of God. That's what he means when he says, the just shall live by faith. The the just, that's you and I. It means we have been justified. What does justified mean? It means that I have been clothed, dipped, immersed in the righteousness of Christ. Christ that now his righteousness, when the Father looks upon me, he sees me in that righteousness. He sees me as spotless, clean, perfection. He sees me in that. He doesn't see me in my sins any longer. That's the beauty of this. We'll talk about that as we go. Just uh, in, in wrapping up here, guys, if you don't know Jesus this morning, give your life to him. Tell somebody if that's what you're doing. No more important decision that a person can make in their life. If you have been drifting, if you've been in a place where you you sense the Lord tugging on your heart, showing you that you need to tighten up on the reins a bit, 
Just give him permission to do it. He'll do the work. All you have to do is go along. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for this passage in Romans. Lord, there's just so much here, so many layers. And yet we know, Lord, that the gospel, the message of the gospel is not complicated. It's simplicity. Just simple redemption. That which you promise to anyone who will call upon you. And for those out there uh, catching this online or on the podcast, uh, I pray for each one, Lord, that you would touch hearts. Touch our hearts, Lord, those that belong to you. Draw us deeper. Let us give you permission to those areas of our hearts where perhaps you've been locked out. For those that don't, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. The gospel is the power of God to salvation to anyone who would believe. We thank you, Lord, for the message. We thank you for the gospel. We pray, Father, that we would be bold in our witness and that we would point the way to you, to point the way home. We love you. We praise you this morning. And in Jesus' name, amen.